Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our fundamentals of a well-designed booth. Um, we've got our expert visual merchandiser, Matthew Goodman, who's going to take you through the fundamentals and the essentials of how to create an elevated booth display for the International Home and Houseware Show. So without further ado, I introduce Matthew Goodman to you. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much for that great introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here, and so it's exciting to be here as well. Um, I'll be uh, presenting today, but I'll also be on site too. So this webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the IHA website under the Education tab. For further information or introduction, please contact Nancy, um, and she is our Senior Manager of Trade Show Business Development or your sales representative at 847-692-0139. So this presentation, this pre I'm sorry, I can't even talk. This presentation today is by me, Matthew Goodman. I am a project manager, a PMP certified, as well as NCIDQ certified, which is National Certification of Interior Design. So I actually am an honors graduate from FIT Fashion Institute in New York City, and then I returned there as an adjunct professor. But one of the reasons why I like to give my contact information and a little bit about my background is because I understand the project management logistics part of getting a booth display and a booth together. And I also understand the artistic part as well. And I'm actually licensed in both. So I get it and I understand where you're, you're coming from in terms of a lot of the questions that you might have. Uh, so please join me. Um, I am a 20 year expert in visual merchandising and a lot of my background spans from global trade shows, national retail giants like Victoria's Secret, Macy's, Lord & Taylor, a lot of shopping mall developers. And so today we'll uncover the essentials needed to elevate your booth presentation across all price points. The IHA is holding the annual Best in Booth Design Award based on many of the topics in this webinar. So visit this uh, URL, housewares.org, show boothmanship, or you can sign up today. So contact Nancy Michael for questions, again, at uh, nmichael at housewares.org or her telephone number. And then another way is you can access this information through the marketing kit found at the houseware.org website uh, slash show slash marketing kit. So there's also the Excellence in Booth Design Awards, which I'd like to talk about. It is exclusive to our show, and pre-registered exhibitors are considered for on-site competition awards in areas of their booth for creative lighting, graphic communication, logo presentation, merchandise fixtures, uh, ways to present your product, and the, basically the total campaign messaging. And these are all areas that we'll focus on today. So are you planning on an awesome booth display? Please register for the Excellence in Booth Design Awards. And you can uh, copy this URL right now. This section offers guidance in the areas of, of property use, color application, graphics, lighting, display fixtures, product placement, and then move-in suggestions. So let's start with property use. Many popular movie, movies and theater productions and retail stores use properties. These are also kind of like as slang called props to set a tone or tell a story. Props help to define the time period, location and guidance for the audience through narratives kind of leading to the conclusion. So what does that mean in a trade show atmosphere? Props also help a great deal with conveying the product line essence, understanding of your product use and increasing chances of buyers like entering your booth. So here's some kind of cool props. Props aid in conveying the essence of a product line within a quick glance. So some props can be as simple as, you know, limes in a bowl, or some props can be as complex as like a mirror clad uh, giant Buddha. So we have kind of like a mirror ball, disco ball gone Buddha. Uh, as a prop uh, as well. So kind of like helps to really anchor the look and convey the look of a line really quickly. Props can be used uh, to help tell a story. So here are our friends at Laura Ashley and the props are kind of like also the product. So it's like a little bit prop product and then there's some furniture thrown in there. Uh, and by the way, that background is a printed background uh, to save on freight fees. So, um, you know, check out what you can use for your own props and uh, have product that might double as propping. 
Props can be used with product and mix them to enhance the storyline. These are all pictures taken from on site at the show, but you can see that some of these props, like in the upper right hand corner, a, a baguette, cutting a baguette, or using uh, candles in the lower left hand corner to set kind of like a spa feel. So make sure that the props that you use and, and really procure uh, are really enhancing to your storyline and can help move the storyline, if you will. So check this out. I mean, I know that not all of you can come up with a uh, display like this because of maybe physical parameters or what have you, but props can be used um, to help tell a story. So props are also kind of like product too. So isn't that a great look for conveying like a wedding, wedding uh, flat uh, tableware and tabletop? Isn't that just wonderful? So become inspired by props that complete an entire look. Both props and product can be used to help tell a story. These photos capture two environments to promote wine openers within the same booth. So I could talk a lot about um, this booth in terms of many of the categories that we're, we're speaking about today, but I have to say that in terms of propping, these guys did a great job. Uh, this is one booth uh, and they're, even though there are four different photos, they're actually all from the same display booth. So you can see how props and furniture and lighting really creates different tones and flavors. And I'd advise you to take a, uh, take a screenshot of this slide. It's really a fabulous booth. Okay, uh, create visual narratives by adding special props to complete a story and present like a really unique look. Like our friends at Neat Freak, they actually kind of like exploded and expanded and have gigantic props like hangers or washer dryers or like huge doorways and windows and even their logos like just blown out and made in a giant way. So you could take like everyday items and make them much larger and make it like a really great booth just through propping. And then my kind of tip in this area is become dis inspired by displays in other industries. So this store window features a huge shoe made of pots and pans and matching lids. I mean, even though they, you know, it's a shoe store and a, a kind of like an entryway to a, a kind of a cooler area and cooler zone, I have to say that, um, you know, I don't know if it's realistic for me to say, hey, guys, go out and make, you know, a gigantic shoe out of pots and pan lids. But I can say, you know, become inspired by something like this. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if you had pots and pans lids to do something a little bit more enlarged like our friends at Neat Freak did? So I think it's kind of cool to like play with props as well. And with that, we, we kind of like dovetail into color and texture and applications. So our friend Gary Seahoff, he's the president of Sophistaplate. He said, quote, it's easy to put together a beautiful display without breaking the bank. I love that quote. Um, so a word about color. Gary and his crew place their items against a neutral background to allow merchandise to stand out. By the way, these are all paper goods. Yes, these are paper plates. The sophisticated background color suggests an upscale quality to this product line. So I think it's the way that you put your items on display and the, and the way that the merchandise is shown that can really uh, add a flavor and a kind of like a zest to the booth. So color is a significant tool used in both presentations and visual merchandising. Uh, combined with the use of an interesting texture, color can be used to make visitors feel different emotions, suggest associations about product attributes, influence the buyer's behavior and evoke different reactions. So for example, rough textures like faux stone and slate are like a rugged country look, kind of like almost like old Ralph Lauren look, a uh, real country, you know, real like a uh, New England-ish kind of feel. Smooth textures like polished metals and glass evoke a sleek urban feel, like something from like downtown Chicago or LA or something like that. So goods can be presented within a monochromatic color scheme. So what does that mean? Okay, first of all, this is from a trade show. This is not a gallery or a museum. This is a trade show booth. Um, monochromatic is like one tone of colors. So if you have like one a tone of color for your merchandise, like whites or all grays or something like that, feel free to expand on that and uh, paint your background or uh, get your background printed with the same type of colors. Uh, I also consider this display one of my favorites and I kind of put it in as like a, almost like centerfold or like if Oprah, you know, Oprah's breathing space, if you will, in her magazine. I, I think that there's a lot to be learned from this display and it's so simple yet um, 
uh, and it's so easy to to put together yet it, it it's so sophisticated uh, so goods can be presented within the monochromatic color scheme. So we're taking it from like a wholesale setting to a retail setting, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, I also wanted to let you know that if you have some goods, you can put them in with limited uh, color schematic suggestions. So what does that mean? So if you have all whites, you can introduce some beiges as well, even through propping. For example, the towel on the upper uh, left corner or the up, upper right corner of the combs, the hair pieces, um, they all kind of like help to uh, prop it out. We talked a little bit about props before, but it also helps to kind of like add a little texture and tone to the uh, area of merchandising if you do have a limited color suggestion in your color palette. So here's some example of goods that are also presented within a color scheme of limited selection. And goods can also be grouped together by similar texture and shape. Like for example, the wine goblets on the upper left, uh, they're uh, all of the same kind of like shape. Uh, however, you'll see that they uh, have the stem that are different colors, but the colors are actually kind of placed together. So there's a real way to uh, arrange the merchandise and we'll kind of get into that a little bit later too in terms of um, how you want your products to move and be sold. So the goods can be grouped together by similar texture and shape and they can be presented within a, a color scheme of limited, uh, limited selection as well. Again, these are all uh, booths at the, at the show and on site, but they also have like different flavors and different tones. So it's kind of like up to you how you want to set up your merchandise and merchandise selection. Items that are not grouped together. So we talked about group, grouping items that are similar together, but items that are not similar together in shape can be grouped together on the same textured background, which kind of like holds the story together and makes it like more cohesive. So you can see that these are items that really have very little to do with each other in terms of shape and texture. You know, some are metals and glass and wood kind of mixed together. And then on the upper left corner, it's all really held together by a nice uh, kind of like custom display fixture. And on the lower right, our friends at Kinetic, they uh, put their items together by using a similar background of the and putting in like swashes, if you will, of the um, electric green. Uh, so again, become inspired by displays in other industries. You know, borrowing inspiration from a furniture display in the upper left corner, this houseware exhibit in the uh, lower right corner. Um, kind of evokes that same mood and format in terms of texture and feel. I, went, I was really surprised to see the similarities between these two exhibits, and they're actually designed uh, by different people at different trade shows. But the Heller exhibit of furniture has the um, platforms that are white, they go across the booth on a diagonal with like kind of slicker merchandise with different colors. Well, um, I was surprised, pleasantly so, to see the same exact exhibit on a smaller scale at the houseware show where the um, platforms go in a diagonal across the booth. It's a very similar color format as well as texture and feel to the merchandise in the Heller exhibit. So become inspired by these different uh, displays in different industries. So, you know, take your cell phones with you and, um, you know, snap store windows or displays wherever you see uh, fit for inspiration for your own displays. So introducing a textured background can better tell a story of displayed merchandise. And these are our friends at Corel Brand. That, by the way, they got best in booth last year. Um, this is a fabulous booth. I really like this because they introduced on the lower left corner uh, a blue background, which is kind of like the uh, signature Corel blue. But then they took up uh, patterns from their traditional dishware and blew the patterns up on the lower right corner to make custom woven rugs. I mean, how awesome is that? Now, I know not everybody's got the budget for that, but you certainly might have the mindset for it. So I really encourage you to um, figure out like within your own display booth, if, you're, if there's something really cool about your product that you wanna, um, wanna blow up and expand, similar to our friends at Corel. And introducing a color uh, background can better 
like tell a story of how the merchandise is displayed. So let's say our friends at Kvel, um, they introduced the color background and kind of like mixed it with a uh, natural wood slat wall background. And then our friends on the other side have like a kind of the same feel. They, they introduced the natural background, but instead of going for a gray, they went for a green background on a smaller display booth. So these are the same concepts I'm talking about, but one's like a bigger display booth, uh, you know, of course, more, um, more budget. And then the other is on a tighter budget on, on the uh, right hand side. Okay, so this display, which features like a really splashy color would translate well to showcase other goods. So, you know, not just going through other industries, but checking out other display booths even on site and saying like, hey, that would be a really great thing. I mean, quite honestly, this, um, this is like a real a bold stab, if you will, a, a bold stance in, in uh, making this booth like this like purple pink color. Um, but if you check out the display fixtures, which are kind of like the raised tables in the centerpiece, that display fixture is very forgiving and would display any piece of merchandise that would show horizontally very well. This whole booth would translate well to many different styles of merchandise. So feel free to, you know, think about changing up a color or changing up a, a style of merchandising uh, based on what you've seen at other shows or even on a retail uh, setting. And the color and texture can set a tone for the mood in the display. In this case, I mean, I saw a lot of grays at the show last year. I think gray is a real popular color throughout uh, product design, throughout our trade shows, throughout real estate now, uh, in, in automotive industry. I, I think gray is a very popular color now. So in this case, gray unifies different presentations to feature goods in a variety of shapes and uses. So you can see that like all different tones of gray are used, yet somehow everything's to be like really pulled together in each and every one of these displays and they have very different styles of merchandise from each other. So feel free to use a, um, a, the same type of tone. And then mixing things, here's our tip, here's our tip. Mixing things like glass and wood makes it a regular booth into like a really featured gem. So if you can imagine this booth, especially the view on the lower right hand corner, which is kind of like a, a we're far away, like a bird's eye view away from it, I will, you know, taken from the aisle. It, it quite honestly wouldn't be that much of a hot booth without the glass enclosure. Um, so just to put something around glass or uh, put special lighting on it or or somehow make it a feature zone within your booth will really make it uh, make the merchandise stand out and the products stand out in a great way. Now, we're going to enter our graphics section, which is one of my uh, favorite sections as well. So the use of graphics and photography and display booths is an effective way of grabbing attention and communicating information to buyers. The most common form of communication in the trade shows is through text and signage to promote things like new products, order minimums, and show specials. So signage should be like uh, short and with a clear message and be consistent with the brand's marketing communication model. So, you know, what does that mean? It, it's consistent, it's a consistent voice throughout all of your marketing channels. So for example, if you um, have one look and feel through your website, I would say that it would be a positive thing to have that look and feel carried throughout your trade show booth as well as any brochures or any videos or any uh, social media and um, perhaps um, marketing manuals that you may be distributing. So printed logos and slogans capture the spirit of the company presentation. Our friends at Flint and Casabella really demonstrate that well here. As well as our friends at Fusion Brands and Neat Freak. And Neat Freak is actually um, that's kind of cool because what they did was they really blew up their logo and then they put a uh, like a, a detail of their booth on the side of one of their walls. So take advantage of all areas of real estate like Neat Freak did. But uh, think, think uh, about the fact that this is real estate that you're paying for. So you want to decorate your booth inside and out, no matter if it is uh, opened or closed. I mean, I personally prefer an open booth, but some uh, exhibitors do have a closed booth. And uh, I really like it if they do have a closed booth to place graphics on the exterior wall. 
graphics can set the tone, educate, and enhance product selection. So these are actually our friends at uh, Bormioli. And uh, what I did was I said, hey, guys, why don't you take your conference area and put some display of product on the conference table? And I did that in both their, uh, their like stool area as well as their um, upholstered area. And it really like pops out and makes such a big difference. So feel free to play with the merchandise, if you will. Um, and anything that enhances sales is a great thing in my opinion. So the background colors and graphics can be complex or simple. Graphics set the tone, educate, and enhance. So that's kind of like my, my uh, thing for graphics on this. Um, I love I love the fact that it, it's really like something that you understand and you can look at the picture in less than a second. And if you were in the aisle, you'd get what the product does uh, quite quickly. And I think that's thanks to the graphics. I do have to go into the operations area a little bit here. Booths over a thousand square feet are eligible to hang signs from the ceiling with the sales manager's pre-approval. But even though your booth might be eligible to hang signs from above, it may not be necessary to utilize uh, ceiling hung signage like our friends at Keurig. So Keurig is above a um, thousand square feet, but they chose not to hang from the ceiling. Uh, they chose to uh, show signage that are floor supported. So again, take advantage of all areas of your real estate. The signage opportunities that you can use will help educate buyers about newness, selection, promotions, and product attributes. So these are kind of like some of the uh, non-traditional signage uh, things that are around the show that I'd like to share with you as well, like video screens that are a little bit higher, but they are not hung from the ceiling. They're from a, a, a structure that's floor supported. And our friends at uh, Nespresso, this is a detail of their Columbia coffee area. Okay, your company logo can be placed squarely on the back wall of your booth, but can also be equally as strong on the side walls. I would suggest making it toward the front of the booth to capture attention from down the aisle, like our friends at Live Vivid. You can see that their, their uh, logo is actually not on center within their side wall. It's really toward the, toward the uh, main aisle. And our friends at Mock Ma put their um, logo squarely on the back of their booth. Most overhead signage is floor supported though. And here's an example of more overhead signage that is floor supported within a display booth. This type of signage needs to adhere to height restrictions per your booth configuration. So work, again, work with your sales manager to assure matching of the rules and regs as well. Just because it's not hanging from the ceiling, um, let's say in our, uh, uh, Vivi Life, Bali, Vivitar zones, uh, it, it still has to match up to certain rules and regs. And same with like an example like Wustoff, that's a double decker booth. So you, you can be sure that there's some serious rules and regs that people have to follow for that booth as well. Um, so, okay, overhead sign, let me just wrap up the overhead signage part. Uh, the ceiling hung installations for booths are uh, with pre-approval and a minimum of a thousand square feet. So again, work with your uh, sales manager on making sure that you're matching all the rules and regs to that and it's all pre-approved. You can also incorporate video presentations as an integral part of your stand design. Compare monitor rental prices with retail pricing when developing your costs. So that's kind of like our nice way of saying, hey, our vendors who are with the uh, show approved audio visual um, show manual may be more expensive for certain items. So if you're just thinking about, let's say, getting a small flat screen TV and placing it in your booth, it might be more advantageous to go uh, once you're on site in Chicago to you know a, a place like Best Buy or something like that and place it in your booth and then either take it home with you or donate it after the show. Um, but with a really large video presentation, you might want to uh, look at what the uh, show vendor has to offer as well. So please perform a like a cost benefit analysis of any of your video presentations prior to ordering at the show as well. So lighting. This is the area that is uh, really very compelling and very interesting as well. 
Uh, it's also an area that not many people talk about. So I, we thought it was really interesting and would be important to convey a section on lighting in this, in this uh, webinar. So lighting aids in telling a story about the space. Whether a company provides a general wash of illumination for like mass, mass merchandising, or if a business is focused on high-end products, like featuring goods with specialty lighting. Okay, so union labor generally electrifies lighting with the convention center, in the convention center. So exhibitors can install and plug in their own light fixtures. So be sure cords are uh, correctly installed, uh, covered and neatly talked like within and behind your booth. So um, that's like the, the general part about the electrical hookup. But in the, this industry uh, presentation, I'd like to talk about what the lighting uh, terms mean. So ambient, task, and accent are the main lighting terms. Ambient lighting, also known as general lighting, radiates a comfortable level of brightness without glare and allows you to see and walk around safely. Um, you'll see this at the convention center. You've also probably seen this in like gymnasiums and, uh, you know, like big box retailers. Please know this may not be enough lighting to correctly show your product. That's our tip. Please do not um, think that you can arrive and show your product well with the lighting that's provided as a general wash of ambient lighting and illumination in the convention center. Task lighting is something good to know about because it provides um, improved illumination to your work area. So you may use different light bulb types and this diff in different shapes and such as clip-on lamps and desk lamps and reading lamps. But so I put the picture in on the lower left of like a desk lamp because you all kind of you know know what that is. Everyone can relate to it. There's like a kind of a trade show version of that which is a clip-on to your lower right um, which uh, offers a type of task lighting as well. So you will you can see this and you'll see it on site at the show and you can also order it through the Freeman uh, online catalog. Freeman is the show decorator. So the accent lighting adds drama to a booth by creating visual interest, which is used to draw the eye to an interesting piece or focal point within the stand. Like our friends at Nespresso on the lower left, they actually have the pendant lighting, which I thought that was really great and created such a like an intimate special moment and on the right our friends at Bodum kind of have a little bit of an opposite feel still with a series of pendant lights almost like a giant chandelier if you will and they're creating like this really kind of like opulent look and and uh, like a feel where they're really welcoming the general public to stop in so these are the types of accent lighting that you'll see and then the light bulbs itself so let me talk a little bit about that here's our tip I'll if I could draw your eye to the lower part of the screen, light bulbs in the lighting industry are generally called lamps. They're not really called bulbs, but anyhow, there's um, an A lamp, which provides warm and general illumination. You'll see these on site at the show and everybody has one of these probably like at home, let's say, and you all know how to screw it in. Uh, it's easy to remember because it symbolizes an idea like in the old cartoon strips and it provides a, um, like a warmer illumination. There are LED versions of this that are like kind of coming out in the industry. Uh, and they're a little bit cooler as well, but you'll see this. These are like really easy lamps to handle and install. You'll also see um, these types of lamps called PAR, which is the upper lamp, and the ER, which is the lower lamp. They're for like warm and focused illumination. A PAR lamp, um, it's usually incandescent, but it is moving toward LED, and I've even seen halogens uh, for it. The ER is like for a general warm wash of illumination. That's like a good, like less expensive version to a spotlight, if you will. There's also quartz halogen lamps, so quartz halogen or LED. They're good for uh, cool, punchy tones. Uh, they're, they're light and they're reflective and they're sparkly. Uh, that's why they're great for your chromes and your silvers and your glassware. Um, actually, a lot of uh, retailers and wholesalers for uh, jewel, jewelry and gem companies use these types of lights. On the lower left is a spool of LEDs. They come in a spool. And I have to say that I was just at Ikea the other day and they're just introducing their spool of lights 
even with a little cut line for um, cutting with scissors. So those school lights uh, used to only be available, and they're still mostly available now online uh, with a uh, with a power cord for plugging in. But now they're starting to come to the market in general. You know, once IKEA gets it, it'll probably be available in other retailers as well. But I just want to let you know, like this is a really great uh, tool because it's light, it's portable, it's easy to install, and it uh, illuminates those kind of like dimmer areas within the display booth. And these are uh, some attributes of both the MR16 lamp and the LED lights. And just a general tip on the LED, uh, MR16, if you are using those, uh, they do come in other sizes. I think there's an MR8 as well. That's a generally newish out there in the display and lighting industry. Uh, please use a cotton glove when installing these because if you have like natural oils on your hands or like if you even just ate a muffin or croissant in the morning, those oils actually burn out that lamp faster. So you'll get a longer uh, longevity by just uh, wearing cotton gloves or like installing these with kind of like a, uh, like a rag or something like that. Um, so there's also your uh, fluorescent lamps. These are for cool blue tones. They have a wider beam spread and soft shadows. Now, I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with the fluorescent tube lamps. You know, anybody who like <laughs> went to school under these or work under these currently um, are familiar with the, you know, the color rendition that they put off. But there's also these compact fluorescents. So they're now compact, they're small, they're screw-in just like uh, with an A lamp. Um, that's the idea light bulb or a bi pin uh, base mount. So there's all these different types of lights that you'll see on uh, on the show floor, and that are available either through the Freeman General Contractor or through just your your big box retailer. So let's move on to display fixtures. Uh, this is an area where um, you know you probably have the, a great variety of places from which to choose to purchase these. So um, a display fixture or types of furniture which are used to feature product in special ways. These are unique fixtures that are often used by retail stores and wholesale show spaces. They have merchandise uh, created, they're actually created around merchandise and merchandising and they help merchandise to be visibly placed within each fixture and that's essential. And buyers place orders on what they see featured on your booth by touching or using the product which are on the fixtures. So place the merchandise on your display fixture to prominently feature your newly launched goods. And before purchasing a display fixture for use in your booth, consider that your merchandise must be, uh, you know, fit on it and look good on it and be visible and easy to access. So some display fixtures are like really easy like on an easel, okay? So placing your product on easels to present themselves in a standing position, it adds dimension to your booth, it adds poise to the display, and it keeps items from blocking each other. You know, I've seen a lot of displays where merchandise just blocks other merchandise. So I like the use of display easels. Here's more display easels and, and uh, stands that uh, kind of keep the merchandise upright, and it shows goods and saves on real estate. Here's, an, here's more examples of, you know, gotta love those easels. But isn't it great to show the easels with a really splashy background and the merchandise displayed on those easels, both in, both in uh, Live Vivid and our other favorite exhibitors? So moving right along, okay, we're gonna kind of go like one notch more up in display fixtures. So placing product on mini platforms and pedestals to present themselves in a standing position adds dimension as well and keeps that display looking really polished and keeps items from blocking each other. And check out uh, the different types of display pedestals. Some are small, like on your uh, left, and on your right, they're a little bit bigger. They're more of like a medium to large size in the display booth. And then there's um, like more sophisticated ways of uh, creating pedestals, like um, kind of like a expanded shelving, if you will. So it, these keep item, the, these these uh, items keep the merchandise from blocking each other. And I think that's really important because so many times I go into display booths where um, sales are just eroded because merchandise is blocking other pieces of merchandise. So we're gonna go up like one more notch um, in terms of fixturing. Some companies choose to feature their goods on custom fixtures, okay? So these are like custom fixtures, especially uh, look at this one on the, this example on the lower right of the uh, fixture shown 
with the blender. So, I mean, it's a custom fixture with uh, lighting and the lighting in there is the compact fluorescent. And so you can see that it's really designed around the fixture. Some companies choose custom fixtures, like in the, in the top picture, but some other companies choose to showcase their goods on stock fixtures. So stock fixtures are items that you just buy like as is, and you place them out in your booth and you, and you uh, arrange the merchandise around what, how the stock fixtures look and the function of the fixture itself. So some companies also feature their goods on semi-custom fixtures, which are like stock items, but then they have a unique quality. Like for example, in the lower right, the um, stock item is the, um, the bulkhead fixture, which is also like a displayer, but the special quality is the fact that they put in Lucite, Lucite um, shelving. All right, and then some companies kind of like mix and match as well. So for example, they might have a custom fixture against the back wall, which is the, I'm gonna call it the ladders. Um, and they also have stock fixtures, which are on the floor, which are the table, the tables. Those are like two tables placed together. So, I mean, it, it, it just might do the trick. Let's see um, how your display turns out. Here's some more examples. Some companies may choose to showcase their goods by combining custom fixture parts, like a marble tabletop with stock fixtures of the legs, let's say, or um, stock fixtures with the shelving. So there's all sorts of ways and like opportunities uh, to look uh, like almost like combine or cobble together some uh, fixtures. And there's all sorts of places where you can go to get those fixtures as well. Um, so don't overlook the fact that some of the stock fixtures just might do the trick in combination with signage and props. And here's examples of some of our favorite exhibitors, like for example, I know that this is a Bodum in the middle um, showing their coffee ware, and they have a stock uh, fixture that they got, and, and it's a, just like a custom block, if you will. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not custom, it's a, a stock block, if you will. Um, so it just might do the trick. So don't overlook the fact that you know some of your stock fixtures may look custom. So we're gonna go to product placement. This is uh, the area that a lot of you uh, probably signed up for this webinar in anticipation of knowing about this. So let's start with Adam Schachter. He's the president and co-founder of the FHE Group, and his line is Fell. We work tremendously hard to ensure that we not only have innovation in our product lines, but in the way in which we display and present them to our retail partners at the show. This means that each and every year we focus on developing a new booth strategy to ensure that we have freshness at the show. Booth design and innovation is a key driver to our success. So a word about newness. Adam and his crew place their new items on display in key areas, and that makes him our hero. So more on that in the next section, because we're going to talk a lot about being a hero. So the overarching concept in displaying goods in a wholesale setting is to consider how your selection of merchandise will look in store. So who's your dream buyer? You know, capture the best way your merchandise will present itself for its final retail destination in whatever store that may be. Uh, offer an opportunity to your buyers to visualize how well your goods will be seen within their own store environments. So remember that buyers are great people. We love them. We welcome them to the, the show. And they're really creative with their budgets, but they may not be creative artistically. So you have to kind of show them how your goods will look from wholesale on the right to a retail application on the left. A lot of our exhibitors show goods how they might be in store. So from the wholesale area, from like from wholesale, this is an actual display from on site. Our friends at Nespresso show the fact that the uh, display can have uh, an industry term called shelf talkers. And a shelf talker is basically like a text that's applied or somehow displayed near or on the shelf that says attributes about the product, as well as the way that the product is arranged but check out the retail application. And then this is the same display that I took once it hit the retail stores, oh, about like six to eight months later in uh, Target. And yeah, you know, you're, you're probably gonna have like boxes from other products um, on display above your, uh, you know, <laughs> above your, 
your display at, at the store. But look at the, um, the detail that I took on the lower right and how much the Nespresso display very much translates on the retail level from the wholesale level. I'm going to show a same example of our friends of Sip by Swell. I mean, they uh, showed their goods in like a variety of format, but uh, in terms of a uh, retail setting, you have to have some breadth and depth of merchandise. I mean, they showed the breadth on the wholesale. Okay, so you can order, uh, you know, an amount of each. But once it's in your retail setting, and this is again on a bulkhead aisle in Target, you can see that there's like a the same feeling, but they're just adding the depth of merchandise to the breadth of merchandise. So you can see like they really had in mind who their their favorite um, buyer was going to be. Okay, so these are our favorite things. The next step is studying how a grouping of merchandise behaves in a space and how it's best featured. Uh, so a lot of you are going to have a group, uh, like a, a, a line of merchandise, more than one product, more than two products. Get a feel of the most trafficked area of your booth. Have the ability to depict the flow of how your buyers will like arrive at the booth. You know, is it down the aisle? Is it from, um, you know, like a, a a cafe nearby? Is it from the bathroom? Is it from the registration stand? Where's it coming from? Is it is it coming from a uh, um, like a a seminar that may be taking place on on the show floor? Divide your merchandise into three groups. There's newness, impulse, and flow. So newness. Goods that your company is newly promoting. Within this grouping, you must identify your items that are poised to be your top performers. You're going to make a lot of money on these, and you're, you're betting that they're going to make a lot of money and they're going to move. Goods that are being introduced at the International Home and Housework Show, they're going to be your newness, also known as your new hero, your hero. These are your heroes. Okay, so an impulse is of merchandise is uh, a selection of goods that are poised for add-ons to increase UPTs, which is units per transaction when ordering. This type of merchandise is also referred to as the sidekick. Within this group, you have identified the secondary item that will enhance the larger order, and you're placing it in a visible position near the new hero. So you got your hero and your sidekick. All right, here's your flow of merchandise, goods that are created to hold a cluster of items together. Yet, you know, they're not really necessarily poised as the top two performers at all. Companies that offer kits of items usually have this type of merchandise, like Tom's to a martini shaker assembly, a checkered tablecloth to a picnic set. Guys, this is like the area where I like to call the flow merchandise in our in our action hero flick, if you will, I like to call the flow merchandise the townspeople. This is like the, the area where, you know, the townspeople get together, they talk about the hero and getting the sidekick and they have their torches and their pitchforks and they rally and they kind of really, you know, support in a way like in, in terms of the plot line, they really support what's going on with the hero and the sidekick and they really create a lot of like excitement around the two items. So take photos of your display booth to document the final design of merchandise placement. That's a really good like you know habit to get into. Um, keep the presentation of your merchandise clear and distinguishable. Now here, don't let the overwhelming use of products or display props become the villain by upstaging your merchandise and potentially eroding sales. It's the villain. Dun dun. You know this is the area where the villain struck here. Um, we love the product and the uh, displays here look like they could use some tightening up. We feel like the uh, villain really struck hard here and um, we're working tightly with a lot of the vendors to, uh, to really get together a very nice presentation based on what we know about the hero and the sidekick. So our heroes to the rescue, like da -da -da -da. <laughs> examples of the merchandising displays feature a hero product. You can hero it out. Um, heroes can be repeated or shown singularly, and they can be examples of merchandising displays um, that are generally against the aisle to grab passersby. Now, this is a different concept than retail. Usually, heroes are like the demand product, which are placed in the back of the store in a retail setting to uh, create a traffic flow and, and make a 
uh, retail customer flow and walk through the entire store to get to the item that they want. But in a wholesale setting, it's kind of almost flipped. You really want to get that merchandise up front and toward the aisle. So these are really great examples of uh, hero products, but not just the product, but it's the positioning of the product as well. More hero products are shown here, and they're placed against the aisles to grab passers-by. In fact, uh, Nambe uh, placed it at a cross aisle, and so did uh, Bodo, our, our friends at uh, Zumbu, and Nespresso is right up against the aisle. These guys don't fool around, and uh, they really know their sales and their merchandise, and they know how to put goods right up on the aisle. And these are, in fact, their hero items. So goods can be shown, the hero goods, and they're really every goods, but mostly heroes in this case, can be shown in color ways, if you will, like a a color variety we call a color way. Here's another example of showing goods in color ways or color varieties. Goods can also be shown in stories. Um, this is a really great booth at the Houseware Show that showed like a story. And one area is on the uh, upper left-hand corner of like a uh, like a girl's office, home office zone. On the lower left is a dining area and kind of like a Soho kind of cool hip loft. And on the uh, right is a kind of like an open style concept of a living space. And this is all within one booth. So I think it was really interesting how they show different stories within one booth. This is one of the strongest booths I've seen uh, at the show as a new intro of display design. Goods can be shown in stories. That was a, the previous slide was a big booth. This is now a small booth. You can still show goods in stories and show kind of like a feel and a look and really get, get a, a flavor and an essence down of what uh, is happening in the booth, but also uh, show your heroes. In this case, the hero is probably um, either the mugs on the upper left or the uh, hot pads. And on the uh, lower right, the hero, I would say, is definitely the mugs and the hot pads as well. Goods can be shown in a boutique style presentation. So like uh, for like very special presentation and making it like a story or if goods can be shown in a mass merchandise. I can't talk, I'm sorry, in a mass merchant style presentation. So it depends on like the uh, buyer that you're going for, on the type of product that you have, as well as um, your ordering um, abilities and abilities to uh, deliver on orders. If you're ordering a massive amount of goods or a smaller amount of goods. So try different ways of showing your goods. Have fun with the product in the presentation. Like our friends here at Live Vivid, this company has their goods on display using many techniques from laying out the products to showing items with the easels and mixing up their merchandise. And, uh, you know, that was mo like more of a boutique style presentation. Now we're going to get into uh, more of like a mass merchant style presentation. Bear Cook's planogram, this is their planogram example. So, you know, you could actually um, show an example of a planogram, even though some uh, some vendors have their own uh, visual merchandise team to uh, set up a planogram based on their order. You, you're also welcome to show this type of illustration to say like, hey, this is what your items could look like in store. This is an actual planogram in action of Oneidas uh, merchandising. So take photos of your display booth to document the final design and merchandise placement for future reference or planogram development. So you can see how um, placing your goods on display and your to do a, a store display and uh, visual merchandise. IMUSA also follows into that same category. Okay, so this is the part of the presentation where I'd like to talk about some move-in information. I mean, oftentimes when um, a, an exhibitor has appointed one person as their project leader for the display and visual merchandising and booth setup. By default, I've noticed they're generally, they've also become the operations manager because they have to know about all the deadlines leading up to the show. And that will very much dovetail into this next section. So let's talk about the move-in information. Daniel Koziel, who's the CEO at Koziel, and uh, he's one of our friends at the show, a better booth display is a bigger smile. So Daniel and his crew emphasize the use of props and color and graphics and product placement 
and move in suggestions. So he actually said it was okay for us to use this display of him being engulfed by his move in boxes. So he's kind of a fun, funny guy. Um, but here's some interesting things that he imparted. There are three general methods for delivering products to your booth for setup purposes. There's pre-shipping for larger parcels. Then there's personal drop-off through the ASUV program. We'll get into that for a second. There's pre-shipping for smaller parcels. So visit the housewareshow.org website for shipping information. Let me just talk a little bit about pre-shipping. <clears throat> okay, so exhibitors who are pre-shipping are going to be exhibitors who fall into the category and is recommended for those who are from outside of Chicago have heavy freight or are shipping from another convention center. It is not recommended to ship fragile or expensive prototype goods or parcels that advertise the content. So, you know, don't ship something that says fancy flat screen TV inside. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, you must ship the holding warehouse, you must ship to the holding warehouse or convention center within a specific time frame prior to the show. Um, so be sure to look at your um, setup manual for that. Also, depending on your booth package, most goods will be delivered directly to your booth. Let's talk about the ASUV program. This is recommended if you are located nearby. You can fit your items into a vehicle no larger than a van, have expensive or one-of-a-kind prototypes, and so you can park and unpack within 20 minutes while delivering your items to your booth using only a manually operating cart, not an electric cart. For participation or eligibility, you have to have a vehicle no larger than a van, two people in the vehicle, a valid parking pass, and one person to stay in the um, vehicle while the other kind of like shuttles the parcels to the booth. Okay, let's talk about small parcels. So let's say you sent um, all of your parcels and then there's like one small thing. I would recommend, and so would the, uh, so would the show staff, if you have a smaller or individual parcel that has to be sent separately from your larger shipment, please ship it to yourself at your hotel. Smaller parcels are usually delivered to the convention center, but may not make it to your booth in time for show opening. During the show, for expensive items or prototypes, there's a designated free security lockup with guarded overnight storage in each hall. So do not store valuables in your empties, which will go, you know, which will go away from the hall. Uh, floor to, by Freeman and being stored by Freeman. Stored empties are not necessarily ac accessible during the show. In fact, it's very difficult to get something from your empties at the show and during the show. Okay, also during the show, included in your booth fee is the Freeman Concierge Elite Program. Again, Freeman is the show decorating company. You will have contact with your, um, with your Freeman rep on site. This offers from Freeman is a premium level of customer service to all exhibitors in our show. Exhibitors can remain in their booths to conduct business while handling concerns with Freeman, traditionally handled at a nearby desk. So you guys do not have to leave your display booth. You can stay in and conduct sales. This provides additional attention, enables the tracking and resolution of exhibitor requests during the run of the show. So these are the details of where to go at Freeman. I know that they'll be posted shortly. Um, and then after the show, generally goods are shipped out of the convention center the same way they arrive. So check your exhibitor services manual and ask your Freeman rep or your EAC, your exhibited appointed contractor, for outbound shipping directions. Also, after the show, the IA, IHHS offers a product donation program if you wish to donate your product to a charity rather than ship it back after the show. The show has pre-authorized charities for, pro, for, for this program. So visit your setup manual or information on the, pro, on the uh, product donation program and list of selected charities. You could ask on site as well. But please do not abandon your product in the booth. If you place your product in the booth without uh, aligning it to be picked up or donated by a charity, um, it will present a, uh, another situation. Okay, so does your booth hit the target? Ask me to check out your booth while on site. I will be on site and your stand could be featured on this page too. I'd love to feature your booth on this display stand. Um, this is an area of the, uh, of the web 
webinar that I love to feature. And these, a lot of these booths, we call it graduated. They graduated through working with me and their sales manager, and they uh, really groom their booths up to a certain level of, of a real high expectation. And they're really industry leaders in the uh, world of display and in our show as well. So I'd love to feature your booth in here. Um, and ask me to come by at the show, and I'll be glad to stop by in person. Um, at this point, I'd like to conclude um, if there's any questions or if there are any um, suggestions, you're welcome to uh, come on in now or you're welcome to email me. My email is matthewgoodman1 at yahoo.com after the webinar. And I do thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience. I am available for individual consultation exclusively for the exhibitors, both pre-show and at the show. I hope you've had a great day.